dismiss Junior Church at this time. Everyone else, please open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 8. Matthew chapter 8. Thank you for that excellent special. Junior Church, you can go. Yep, there they go. They know where to go. I miss our bus kids. You know, when they're here, it's kind of like a stampede to Junior Church. And that's a lot more fun to me. We try to control the stampede for the good of the stampeders, but I do enjoy it. <laughs> Matthew chapter Matthew chapter 8. And uh, when you found it, by the way, Matthew's the first gospel in the New Testament, about two-thirds of the way through your scripture. If you do need a copy of the scripture, there are uh, plenty of Bibles available in the chairs uh, and the, underneath the chairs and the chair racks. And make sure that if you do need a Bible, that you ask for one or kind of look around. That's a good example of that. Yep, if you need a Bible, just, just get one. One of the things that I believe in as far as getting things done is just looking frantic. You're like, oh, like, you know, do one of these things. And somebody will notice, and they'll be like, what's the matter? You say, I don't have a Bible, and then they'll get you one. Okay, so that's all you have to do around here to get something done, I think. <laughs> Matthew. Chapter 8. By the way, let me give you just a quick update. I'm, I'm sure you don't want to know too much about my personal life, but regarding my New Year's resolution of uh, trying to be nice this year, just let you know how that's going. I've, my resolution this year is that I want to try not to pick on people, and I want to try not to be sarcastic with people. Let me let you know how that's going so far. Every time I've tried to be nice to someone so far, they accuse me of being sarcastic and picking on them. <laughs> That's how that's working out for me. And a couple of times, I think that they've been right. My wife has said, well, you are being sarcastic. And I think, oh, well, I'm working on it. And uh, maybe maybe it won't be my New Year's resolution next year. But I'm going to try to be nice. And you can have a lot of fun laughing at me while I try. You know, maybe God doesn't want me to be nice. You ever think about that? Mm -hmm. Really think about that, Brother Randy. Does God want me to be nice? Yeah. Oh, he does want me. So Randy says, yeah, he does. <laughs> So, you know, uh, that's a really nebulous term. It has a really nebulous definition, doesn't it? You know, uh, I, I learned when I was a teenager that it's actually not nice to not tell people things that are wrong. I learned this actually from my grandma. My grandma was singing in our church. It's okay if I tell a personal story. Okay, she was singing in our church. This doesn't have anything to do with the message today in case you think it has a point to it. It doesn't. It's just a story. She was singing in our church, and uh, she was having a wardrobe malfunction. Her slip was slipping. And the more she moved, the more it slipped. And, uh, you know, we thought it was funny. And I remember on the way home, uh, my sister told her about it, and Grandma didn't think it was funny. She said, you should have said something. You should have done something so that, you know, I didn't look like that in front of people. And actually, she's exactly right about it. Uh, <laughs> the reality of it is something that's kind of embarrassing or something that's awkward for someone uh, would be something that, you know, you should try to say. But it doesn't seem nice to say, hey, fix that. You know, it seemed like you're pointing out something. It seemed like it would embarrass someone to tell them something embarrassing. But it's one of those things where you just kind of have to do. Uh, the same is actually true with a fatal flaw or a sin in someone's in someone's life. When somebody has sin, and you know, most of the time we just want to be nice to them. We don't want to tell them, "Hey, you know, that the wages of sin is death." As Charlie said, Romans six twenty three is in the context of a believer's life. In other words, talking about believers having victory, and what's the end of sin for a Christian? Death. Sin kills. It's dangerous. So we don't want to say, hey, this is wrong. You shouldn't be living like this or this isn't, isn't right in your life. And yet, it wouldn't be nice not to say something. And so, sometimes being nice is a little bit confusing, isn't it? Sometimes being, uh, we think that bluntness or forthrightness is sinful when actually it's the thing that's called for. And it's actually the nice thing. So, there you go. You can have that for whatever nugget it's worth this morning. It has nothing to do with the message it just has to do with my New Year's resolution. And by the way, I appreciate the support for you people that liked me when I was mean. Uh, thank you very much for liking me that way. I don't know if it reflects on your own carnal nature 
that you can relate to me, or whether... <laughs> okay, let's stop it. All right. It's, it's okay to joke about myself, right? Make fun. I can make fun of me and still be nice, right? Okay. Matthew chapter 8, and we'll go down to verse 5, and I am really thrilled about the truth that we're going to see in the Scripture today. So go to verse 5 of Matthew chapter 8, will you please? And we'll pick up there for our text this morning. This is, the Bible says, when Jesus was entered into Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion, being bes or beseeching him, and saying, Lord, my servant lieth at home sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. And Jesus saith unto him, I will come and heal him. The centurion answered and said, Lord, I'm not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof, but speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. For I am a man under authority, having soldiers under me, and I say to this man, Go, and he goeth. And to another, Come, and he cometh. And to my servant, Do this, and he doeth it. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to them that followed, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. And I say unto you that many shall come from the east and west, and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, in the kingdom of heaven. But the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And Jesus said unto the centurion, Go thy way, and as thou hast believed, so be it done unto thee. And his servant was healed in the selfsame hour. Well, let's ask God to help us just to really solidify the truth that I think we've already gotten reading the text this morning. Father, thank you this morning for Jesus, Lord, those are not just words. For who Jesus is is what we're thanking You for. We thank You that we have a Savior that is pleased by and marvels when we have faith. We thank You for a Savior who came to seek and to save that which is lost. I pray that You would help us as we look at our Savior today to be among those that come from the east and from the west and sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in your kingdom. We ask in Jesus' name, Amen. Wow. This is a packed section of the Gospel of Matthew, isn't it? We have just finished looking at discipleship ending in uh, chapter 7. And last week we really kind of had... Uh, just an overview, we looked back at, at the aspects of discipleship. We looked at all the things that Jesus requires of those who've signed up, who volunteered, who followed, who've answered the call to be disciples. We've been reminded each week, and I think we should continue to remind ourselves, that discipleship and the gospel are not one and the same. Discipleship is a person who makes a decision to be a follower or a learner. And not every person who is saved is a disciple, and not every person who is a disciple is saved. And we saw that illustrated. You know, a lot of people really butcher this gospel because they make discipleship in Matthew the requirements for salvation. My friend, let me just tell you something. No disciple was ever good enough to be able to say, I have done everything that was required of me for being a disciple. No one's ever done that, and so no one, if discipleship or the gospel, would be in heaven. That's a fact. The other thing that we remind ourselves about is that Judas was a disciple, but Judas wasn't saved. And I think that's a just that ought to be a point that really rings home the reality that discipleship doesn't save a person. Belief in Jesus, faith in Jesus Christ, is what is necessary for salvation. Now, how many believers ought to be disciples, though? We all should. So how well does Matthew in the, the portion of the Scripture from chapter 5 through 7 apply to us? Well, I'll tell you what, every single point hits home for me. And matter of fact, uh, last week when we went through each of the requirements for a disciple, one of the things that uh, I got feedback from, from the folks we were preaching to last week was, <clears throat> you know what, if you were to say to me, you want to be a disciple, I'd say sign me up. But when you start getting specific about the things Jesus requires of discipleship, I'm not sure I'm all the way signed up. 
people kind of say things like that to me. Like, wow, you know, when I look at what Jesus expects of a disciple, I'm kind of a disciple. But I don't know how committed I am. Many folks last week in our church committed to discipleship. And I want to commend you for the commitment encourage you uh, to just really, really study that portion of the Scripture and let the truth of it sink in your heart and do what you've said. Be what you've said. It'll be an amazing year for you. It'll change your life if you'll do what you've committed to as far as being a disciple of the Lord Jesus. Now we're in a different bit of material. This is the part where Matthew's Gospel, is, which is telling who Jesus is. Jesus is the Gospel, you know. Uh, when Matthew is explaining not just who Jesus is, but explaining what Jesus did. Now, one of the things that Jesus Himself said about the miracles that He did was that they were to show or to evidence that He was God. If you ask the question, why did Jesus heal people? <clears throat> On a basic level, Jesus healed people because they needed to be healed. Uh, the, in the beginning, there was a leper. In the beginning of chapter 8, he came to Jesus and he said, If thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. And Jesus said, I will be clean. And then Jesus said, Don't tell anybody about this. Go show yourself to the priest and let that be the end of it. Uh, so Jesus wasn't trying to heal to prove that he was God at that moment. He was just healing because the man needed to be healed. I want to just tell you something, friend. God cares enough about you that it doesn't have to fit into a world plan to change the world for Him just to answer your prayer. Sometimes we think, unless it's part of God's big plan, God won't do anything for me. In other words, God will only answer my prayer if it, you know, if it fits into His purpose to save the lost. You know, God might just answer your prayer just because He loves you. You ever think about that? He healed the leper for that reason. And it's evident in, in the first verses. That is the message today, but it needs to be mentioned. But Jesus did say in chapter 8, He said, uh, They that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. That's uh, in verse 13 of Matthew chapter eight or chapter 9. I'm sorry. I'm not going to preach that today. There's a lot of... All these events where Jesus did things that were supernatural... All these things, that each of these things which Jesus did, not only evidenced uh, that He was God, but He had a purpose in them. Most of the miracles that Jesus did, understand this and get my point now, most of the miracles Jesus did were to show people that He was God. Sometimes we uh, sensationalize the supernatural that we miss the purpose in it. Don't let it pass, don't let it get past your understanding that every person who God has ever healed has also physically died. A lot of people think, you know, healing is what God wants. God wants us to not suffer. God wants us to uh, not have hardship. God doesn't want us to have to endure anything, and God doesn't certainly want us to physically die. Well, my friend, that isn't so. Death is an upgrade. Yesterday evening, I actually was with Brother Chris Lewis, assistant pastor in, in at West Park Baptist Church. His sister... Uh, his sister passed yesterday. She was 21 years old, 21 year old girl, and she had leukemia and, and she died yesterday. And I was with him. And one of the things that I was struck by is that God doesn't want everybody to live forever. You know, she's born again, she's in heaven, but it's kind of tough losing a 21 year old. Right? You know, she's just a child to me. I remember she was four years old, you know, and just being a little, little, little bitty girl. And she went to, to heaven yesterday. And, you know, God could have healed her if he wanted to, and he didn't. And she's in heaven. She has a four-year-old son that uh, that's going to need God's grace in, his, in their life and all these things. And I look at these situations and I realize it isn't God's will always for a person to be healed. And every person who is healed eventually dies. Sometimes we think that a number of years is so vitally important, you know, whether a person gets 100 or gets 40 or gets 20 or gets 5. The fact of the matter is God wants us to serve Him to live for Him. It's amazing what Jesus did in three and a half years as an example of someone who's filled with the Holy Spirit. And you could have three and a half years of serving God and have a full life. And so uh, years don't mean anything. So I want to just put that in perspective. And then I want to look at specifically what Jesus did. Uh, there is a series, chapter 8, chapter 9, are a series of events where Jesus did supernatural things primarily with healing people of things that were impossible to be healed from. In verse 5, though, we pick up with this centurion 
that came to Capernaum uh, to Jesus. And I want to, of course, look at something that impresses us, first of all. Uh, in verse 6, he said, My servant lieth at home sick of the palsy, grievously tormented. I'm impressed by this centurion's regard for his servant. Aren't you? I'm impressed that this centurion, he, he describes himself as a man of authority, one who can say to people, go, and they go, and come, and they come. A, a man of some importance uh, that does not just simply see his servant as someone who is vital for his personal well-being. He, he's concerned, he's grieved over his servant being sick. And, you know, he could have said go to somebody and sent them to ask Jesus to heal his servant, couldn't he? Think about that. He said, you know, if he's a man of authority and he can say to somebody, you go do this, and they have to go do it, why did he come to Jesus to see his servant healed? Well, I think the answer is obvious. I don't think you have to read into it deeply to say he loved his servant. And there are just some things that are important enough that you don't delegate. There's some, some task that you don't send someone else to do. I feel that way about pastoring a lot of times. You know, sometimes I, uh, I, 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 I pastor, it, I feel like I pastor people that go to much larger churches, and not, not in this church, but I just tell you, during the week, a lot of times I spend time with people pastoring them or dealing with counseling and that sort of thing, and they don't even come to our church, but they have pastors that don't pastor them. And I just, I feel like, you know, if they, if they were to call at their church, they've done it. They've called and said, I need marriage counseling. And they say, well, you know what, fill out this line or this list or whatever, and, and then we'll, at this time, we'll get to you. And some impersonal person that doesn't preach to them that they don't know anything about is going to come and process them, and they just feel like, well, you know, that person doesn't love me. Well, you know, you want a pastor to pastor you, don't you? I mean, that's the, way, that's the way I feel. And I just think, man, if I have something that I call the pastor for, I don't want him to send someone else. And that's the way this centurion is with his servant. He's saying, it's my servant. I'm the one that loves him. I'm the one that cares about him. And I'm going to go ask Jesus. Maybe someone else wouldn't ask the same way. I've sent people before. I've asked people to do tasks. And I end up having to do it because they don't do it the way that I asked to do it. Or they don't get treated the same way that I get treated. Uh, Brother Alex Lopez... <laughs> He used to always have me go with him whenever he had to deal with bad customer service. I remember one time he had a battery in his car that was under warranty. It was only a year old and it had like a five-year warranty on it at, at uh, your store, Advanced Auto Parts, so Obed. And, uh, I forgot that wasn't there. I know. He would have got great customer service if Obed was there. But he went there to get it warranty. He asked me, he said, will you go with me to get it warranty? I said, no, you don't need me. I said, just, just go get it warranty. He went there and they said, do you have your original receipt? He said, no, but I bought it from this store. For whatever reason, they couldn't find him in the computer. His battery was obviously, you know, a new battery. had their brand and all that stuff on it. And they would not warranty his battery out. So I went there. And I went inside. And I carried his battery in. And they just warrantied it out. They didn't give me any of the run around, the rigmarole, none of it. They just warrantied it, just like Obed would have. Just made it happen. You know, and I don't know what it is about Brother Alex, but he gets automatically disrespected wherever he goes. And I get respected a lot of times when I go places. I, I don't know what it is, but sometimes you send somebody to do something, and it just the outcome's not the same. You know, this, who sent you? The centurion sent me. Well, you know, you have proof that he sent you? Well, no, but I mean, I work for him. Well, if you know, if he doesn't come himself, I'm not. You know, he came to do his own. He came, and he, he, it's because it was a valuable thing, and it touches me a little bit. This centurion, honestly, he touched Jesus and he touches me a little bit that he cared enough about his servant to come and ask for his healing. I have no doubt in my mind that he could have replaced his servant. No doubt in my mind he could have replaced the servant, but he didn't want to because he cared for him. And then, uh, so he came to Jesus and this is what Jesus said to him. And this is a second thing in, this, in, the, in the account that's, that is valuable or is important to us. Uh, Jesus saith unto him, if my schedule works out, and if I get done, you know, dealing with this multitude here, uh, then I'll come. You ever think about what Jesus is doing here? I mean, he's got three and a half years to prove that he's the Son of God. He's got to go to the cross. He's got to die for the sins of the world. He has world problems. Right? Did he? I'm, not, I'm not being silly or sarcastic when I say that Jesus had big things to do. Jesus had big things to accomplish. And it so happens, if you read the description of where he's at and what he's doing now, that there are multitudes following him. 
So here he is being followed by multitudes, and he's saying, okay, I'll leave the multitudes and go to your house and heal your servant. And you and I would say that isn't good scheduling. It's not efficient. It's not effective. You know, helping one person when you're uh, ministering to thousands, is it's better to, to deal with the thousands than the single unit. Isn't it true? And wouldn't that be in some instances good reasoning, common sense? I found in my ministry that sometimes... Uh, I have to discern between doing things where people uh, really, really uh, dominate my time, like they really just take like large portions of my time, like days out of the week for things, and I have to say, you know something, I owe it to the ministry to not put everything here. I need to be, you know, I need to do things that are for everybody. But they, all those things in balance, each of those in balance, isn't it so? So... I'm impressed by the fact that Jesus said, I'll come and heal him. That's exactly what he said. Uh, Lord, my servant's sick of the palsy, and Jesus said, well, I'll come to your house and heal him. The heart of God. Again, what do we say? God cares about you. God cares about things that aren't just for him. You know, things for you are for God a lot of times. Sometimes we get this picture, or this idea about God, that He's this distanced, uninvolved, almost Allah, if you don't mind the expression, like. That is, Allah is, you know, the, the God of the Muslims is a lot of times the way we think our God is. He's impersonal. You are made only to be sacrificed for Him. But our God, our Savior Jesus, sacrificed Himself for us. And Jesus came to earth not to set up His earthly kingdom, not to be glorified as God the way that He should have been. Jesus came to earth to die for our, for our sins. He came for us. And friend, if you do not understand that God really loves you and He's very merciful and He's very compassionate and He's concerned with not only your needs, but He's concerned with the things that make you well, you'll have a better understanding of who God is. And God simply says, God the Son says, I'll come and heal him. And you and I would say, Jesus, you don't have time for that. You're doing more important things. You know, let him truck his servant over here. Let him, you know, put him on a cart and bring him here. And if he survives, fine, you can heal him. But otherwise, you know, you have worldwide problems, worldwide ministry to deal with. And this man is not even Jewish, by the way. He's not important enough for you. Uh, he doesn't fit in your kingdom plans. Well, here's what the man said. Verse 8, Lord, I'm not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof, but speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. For I'm a man under authority, having soldiers under me, and I say to this man, Go, and he goeth, and to another come, and he cometh, and do to my servant do this, and he doeth it. So there's two things that the centurion said here. The first thing he said, and Jesus doesn't contest it, is he said, I'm not worthy to have you be in my home. Jesus doesn't even argue with that. Now, it's sort of a moot point because we're not worthy to have Jesus walk on terra firma. In other words, to have Jesus stand on sin-cursed earth, the earth is unworthy of Jesus. The world wasn't worthy of the Savior that came to us. Isn't it true? It's very true. We're not worthy. And Jesus doesn't argue with the servant's logic. You know, this Christmas, that was one of the truths that really transcended a lot of the truths that I was thinking about, about the coming of Christ and His love. It was the, the irony that Jesus being born in a stable was incredibly appropriate. A lot of times we make a big story out of, oh, Jesus, poor Jesus, there was no room in the end, He was the Son of God, and they should have given Him the best lodging they had. My friend, the best lodging in the world isn't good enough for Jesus. And so it actually was very appropriate that he was lodged in some of the worst lodging because it really emphasizes that truth. If you had to put him in the, in the finest palace of the finest king, it would be such a demotion from heaven where Jesus came from that it's an insult. Our best for Jesus would be an insult at best. And so it's, it's, it's actually appropriate just to go all the way with the insult and get the full latitude of the picture. You understand that? In other words, it's a great thing that Jesus was born in a stable because it's every bit as much of an irony for God in heaven to be born in a stable as it would for be for God in heaven to be born in the finest inn or the finest castle. 
So, uh, the fact that Jesus came, we're not worthy of. And that's what the centurion said to Jesus. He said, I'm not worthy to have you come in my house. Hey, listen, I'd love to have Jesus come to my house, but I'd be a little embarrassed too. It's not good enough for Him. You know, not embarrassed because it's what God's given me, but just the fact of the matter is the best I could do for Jesus wouldn't be good enough. Think about if you were preparing a meal for Jesus. Think about, about what you do. I mean, what you prepare for anyone else and it'd be your finest and your best, you just wouldn't give to Jesus. You know, and, and so the centurion emphasizes that. Then, also... He said the second thing, and this is what impressed Jesus the most. <coughs> Jesus doesn't respond at first, but He said, Speak the word only, and My servant shall be healed. In verse 10, the Bible says, When Jesus heard it, He marveled and said to them that followed, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith. No, not in Israel. Jesus marveled. The word marvel means was amazed. Now stop here a second. Who would think, as we like to say, who'd have thunk, that God could be amazed at anything? I hope that that sinks in. I hope that arrests with you because this is a big deal. This is very important. Would you like to impress God? Yeah. Yeah, you, you say, well, Pastor, you know, I don't want to brag. I don't want to be, I don't want to be like that. Would you like to impress God? Yes. yes. Yeah, why not you say, well, Pastor, God shouldn't be impressed with me. I'm not impressed with God. No, 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 that's not the point. See, I'm not, it's like asking the question, would you like to be great? Would you like to do great things? Now, do great things, humanly speaking, no, not so much. But as far as God, the, Jesus said, greater things than these shall you do, because I go unto my Father. In other words, God says He wants you to do great things. Jesus said, greater things than He does He wants you to do. And that's His plan for you. And the question, should you do great things? The answer is absolutely. That's what God wants. It's not a prideful thing to say, I want to live a great life. I want to do great things for God. It's not a prideful thing. It's not a, one of those things where, you know, I want everybody to, you know, I want my picture to be up here and for everybody to look at me and be impressed and think I'm a superhero. No. Do you want to do great things for God the way God said? Yes. I want my life to be amazing. God gave me this life. I'm living. I'm breathing. I have a purpose. God has a plan for me and I want to fulfill it. I don't want to miss out on anything. And so the question, would you like to impress or amaze God? My answer is yes. So when I see a statement like Jesus, when, when, he, when he heard this, he marveled. He was amazed. And he made a verily statement. Anytime you see verily in the Scripture, it's, a, it's actually a notable thing. We get the notion of and kind of from verily. But verily means extremely true. Or this is profound. This is a major truth. And Jesus is, is amazed. I'm amazed that Jesus is amazed. How about you? Yeah. Does that surprise you? I mean, I see a man, you know, humbly stating the facts as they are, and he say, said two things. He said, you're too good to come to my house. That's not amazing. That's true. And he said, if you just say, you know, that, you, that my servant's healed, that's good enough. You know, I know what it is to be an authority. I know what it is to uh, command something to be done, and you, you can say it's done, and that'll be good enough for me. You don't have to come by my house. Just, just, just uh, speak the word, and my servant will be healed. And Jesus said, that's amazing. And he didn't say it to the centurion. He's got this centurion here, and I want you to think about this. Who are the multitudes ethnically that are following Jesus? Who are they? What ethnicity? Jews, Jews right? They're all Jews, and appropriately so. Okay, how do they feel about a man who's not Jewish coming and monopolizing Jesus' time, do you think? Do you suppose? Okay, let's, let's imagine the scenario just a little bit. Charlie, you're, you're my Johnny on the spot normally, aren't you? Why don't you come up here and uh, let's see here. Uh, all right, we're going to all be Jews, okay, today. And uh, you're Charlie, you're, you're, you're the centurion, you stand there. I'm going to go back here, and I'm not going to be Jesus. I'm going to stand where Jesus is standing and speak from here as Charlie gets here. Now, he's an outsider, and obviously, as far as everybody in here is concerned, he's outside, isn't he? I mean, he's on the back of the crowd. Well, let me ask you a question. A centurion would mean that he represented uh, what government? 
Roman. Rome. Okay, so he'd be a Roman. And how were things as far as equality and rights and so forth with the Roman government? Like, what would a Roman? What would a Roman be able to do in Israel? Anything. Anything he wants to, right? Okay, so if there's a multitude and there's a crowd, and the centurion comes and gets into the crowd, what's what are people going to have to do? Get out of the way. They're going to have to get out of the way. Well, okay, so now your Messiah, your Savior, has come, and and you're all amazed by him, and we're in this this love period where you know they don't mind anything Jesus has said or is doing yet. Nobody minds Jesus healing people or doing these great works. Okay, so you're having this time alone with Jesus, along with the thousands of other people who are also alone with Jesus. And a stinking Roman shows up. <laughs> okay, you see this? All right, come on. Now, how do you like this guy just pushing everybody out of the way and just making his way right to Jesus? We don't like it, but you can't do much about it, can you? And so here he is, and now he says, you know, my servant's sick, and if you'll just say the word. And Jesus says to him, I'll come to your house. And everybody there is saying, wait a second, you're with us. Hey, he's a, he's a what? He's a Roman. He's a Gentile. He is an outsider. He's not part of the kingdom. He does not have the right to be here. And even though we can't do anything about it, we don't like it. And we surely don't like it that Jesus says, I'll just come to your house. You see it? We, don't, we, we pass right over that in the text, but that's the reality of it. Okay, you can sit down. Thank you, Charlie. I wasn't mean to him, was I? Okay. All right. You want me to hug him? He wouldn't like that, so it'd be mean. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, but you see the picture? I mean, the irony of it is that this person just comes, has access to Jesus. No one can do anything about it, but no one likes it. And Jesus responds to him by saying, I'll come to your house. And he said, you don't need to come to my house. Uh, just say the word, my servant will be healed. And Jesus said, that's amazing. What was amazing? He saw the faith of the man. Now, I want to point out to you that the centurion was fully aware of the way that the Jews thought about him. Wouldn't you say? I mean, the man, it's, he's not naive. He doesn't think, you know, they really like me here. He's not thinking that. You know, I'm a popular guy. Everybody loves me. No, he knows. They don't like me. And he realizes, but that's God. And I need God's help. And I don't care. I don't care what I have to go through in order to get to God. I just need Him. Friend, that's a great example of neediness, isn't it? You know, sometimes people won't come to church and hear the gospel and be saved because they don't want to be embarrassed people seeing that they have a need. Sometimes people won't come because they don't like the people there. I'll just tell you something. If you've got a need, you need to go to the place where Jesus is. You just need to go to God. Get over your pride. Get over yourself. And it took a great deal of humility for this centurion, I promise you, to go to Jesus. And it took a great deal of faith as well. And he had that all, all settled and it absolutely impressed Jesus. And Jesus said this. And this is... This fits with the theme that we're looking at as we go through Matthew. Jesus said, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. Jesus said, I've never seen anything like it. In the place where I ought to see it. Of all the places that there ought to be faith, it ought to be the people that have had full access to God. Friend, the irony oughtn't escape us that oftentimes we as believers expect less from God. We who have known God, we who have known Him the best, know more about Him, or more solid, sound doctrinally, know Him better than people who have had very little access, but we don't have the same kind of faith a lot of times. And here Jesus does not express that faith is forbidden or faith is impossible for the people to whom He's come. He just marvels that somebody who doesn't belong has more faith than those who do. And we know of other examples, don't we, when Jesus uses the example of, of the feast that He's prepared and He sends and bids people to come to the feast and they have all the reasons for not coming. And so then Jesus goes on to say, go into the highways and the hedges and just compel them to come in. He said, bring all the blind, all the beggars, all the halt, all the maim, all the lame. Just bring all those people and then my house can be full. 
And Jesus describes His house here. He describes His kingdom by saying this in verse 11, that many shall come. I, I, I'm fixing, I'm skipping the saying part. That many shall come from the east and west and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. Now, if you read about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and then you read about them in Hebrews 11 as well, one of the things that you will be reminded about is that what set them apart from everyone else was their faith. And you know what set this man apart from the people who were the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? His faith. His faith. And then Jesus expresses another sad truth. The children of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The irony is that people from the east and people from the west it's interesting, we're in Matthew, and just a few weeks ago we saw the men that came from the east. It said, where is he that is born king of the Jews? We have seen his star, and we're come to worship him. They came from the east, but the people that were there weren't concerned about seeing the king. And we saw the contrast between people who are outsiders desiring a savior, desiring a king, and people who are insiders feeling rather flippant or as though it's not a big deal that they have access to the king. God's impressed by faith, my friend. He's not so much concerned about where you come from. If you were to read in chapter 10, and you, you ought to do this on your spare time because it will help you before we preach it. If you were to read in chapter 10, you'd see when Jesus sent His disciples out two by two, that He told them, He said, don't go into Samaria, don't go into any place that's not Jewish, and preach the gospel of the kingdom of heaven. It's important for us to realize that this kingdom of heaven is not a Jew. He's not speaking of the kingdom of the Jews. Jesus is going to come again as the king of the Jews, and he's going to rule and reign on this earth. And it'll be a Jewish kingdom, and we see that described in the Revelation. But the kingdom he's talking about here is not the kingdom on earth, it's the kingdom of heaven. And he specifically says that in the kingdom of heaven, Abraham will be there, Isaac will be there. Jacob will be there, and they're going to sit the, and, and sitting with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are going to be people like this centurion. Matter of fact, I uh, I'm not a gambling man. I don't think it's right to be, but I would I'd put money on it that this guy specifically is going to sit with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This Roman centurion, whom the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob positively cannot stand. They loathe him. He's going to be sitting at the same table as the guy that they're so proud of being descendants of. And the way he'll get there is through faith in Jesus. The way he got there, I should say, is through faith in Jesus. And you can be there too through faith in Jesus. Friend, I know that's not a complex message, but there's a big difference in the outcome when a person who has access to Jesus <laughs> receives Him and believes in Him versus a person who has access to Jesus who rejects Him and is cast into outer darkness. Where the Bible says there's weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. My friend, that's the lake of fire. That's hell and the lake of fire described there. Faith is important, isn't it? Could we say it's the most important thing when it comes to Jesus? And you know, what the author of Hebrews said when he said, without faith it is impossible to please Him. The exact opposite is also true. With faith, it is possible to please Him. With faith, it's possible to please Him. And can we go ahead and on the authority of the Scripture today say it's possible to amaze Him? Hmm. With faith, it's possible to amaze Him. God help us. God help us to put our faith in Jesus. Father, thank You for the simple message today. Lord, the implications of it are exactly what we need. God, we need to have faith in Jesus. First, for our salvation. Secondly, for the things we ask for.
And I just pray that it would be true, it would be said of us by you that you marveled at our faith. God, could that be true of us at some time in our lives? Could it be said of us just like the centurion? They'll be sitting with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob because of their faith. What an amazing thing. Thank you for this. God, thank you for being the kind of a God and sending the kind of a Savior that Jesus is to us. Pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning I'm not going to have a come forward decision type of an invitation, but I do want to have an invitation. So here's how it is. I want to make sure that every person here has eternal life. It would be very, very missed. As far as I know, I think I know every person here today. As far as I know, you've trusted Jesus as your Savior. But if you haven't, you know and God knows, actually. You know, sometimes that matter of faith, the thing that will hinder it is a matter of pride. Sometimes we're too prideful to it, even confess and say, I need to be born again, I need to have a Savior. Sometimes we look to something other than that simple moment of being born again, trusting Jesus as our Savior. Sometimes we trust that instead of Christ. And friend, can I say to you, God's not impressed by that. He's impressed by faith. If you're not born again, could you just be real and honest with God about it and receive Jesus? The Bible says as many as received Him to them gave you the power to become the sons of God. It isn't a matter of being baptized. It isn't a matter of being uh, born into an organization or being a member of a church. It's a matter of simple faith. And God knows it. And God's made it so that you can understand it. And you need to receive Him. If that's you and that's, that, and that's today for you, would you just receive Him? You could right now with your eyes open looking at me and nobody knowing it, just say, God, I want Jesus to be my Savior and God will save you right now. His Spirit will come into you. You're here today and you're dealing with a matter of faith and you're a believer. But there's just a matter of where God's Word has either said, you know, this is what I want. Oftentimes faith is a matter of obedience, the exercise of faith. Whereas God says, this is right, but you won't do it and you have a reason why. But the real reason is lack of faith. Could you just simply give it to God? Maybe it's sin. Maybe it's an area of, of personal victory. Could you just say, God, today I'm going to give this up. And I'm going to trust you that I'm going to be okay. Because I feel like I won't. God, today I'm going to do what I know I should have done. You showed me this. I, I've been under conviction for it. Maybe it's a matter of faithfulness as a Christian. Maybe it's a matter of commitment. Just giving God something that you think you can't afford to with regard to your time or anything else. You just say, God, you showed it to me. I know, I've know. i known that is what you want. And today I'm going to trust you by faith. You can make that decision right where you're at. You can say that right to God. And I don't need to collect uh, some kind of a decision card or anything like that so that I could know about it. But if you need someone to pray with you and you need help with it, I'm available. And I'd like you to know that after the service today or even during this week, you call and say, Pastor, God spoke to me about a matter of faith and I either need a witness or maybe I need some more clarity about what God has said. And we're available for you and we want to be able to help you with those important spiritual matters. God bless you for being here. It's good to have each each of you here today. I want to ask Brother Vilsus if you just stand and, and dismiss us with a word of prayer today. Wait, please. Father in heaven, we are thankful for the opportunity to be in your house this Lord today. Father, thank you for the message and for how the Spirit has spoken to us. And I pray, Father, that you'd help us to surrender the uh, areas in our lives, Father, that your Spirit is pointing uh, your finger on. I pray, Father, that we would uh, have a faith that would amaze you, have a faith that would please you in all things. Pray for anyone here uh, who may not know Christ as Savior. I pray that even uh, today, this week, Father, would be the time where they come to accept Christ. And for the Christians here, I pray that we would all be built up and encouraged, helped this week. I pray that we would go out this week living by faith and pleasing thee in all things. I trust you for all things in Christ, and we pray. Amen. Amen.